Whoa! Audison's Voce AV 5.1K 1650 watt power amplifier. Wow, look at that. Now this amplifier, I don't need to be a spec book, but this quotes a CEA 2006 compliant power rating of 75 watts by two channels, 140 watts by two channels, and 600 watts by one channel, all at four ohms at under 1% total harmonic distortion plus noise. And that means that this is not a four channel amplifier with a sub amp as well. This is, uh, two pairs of two channels and one mono channel as well. And they're all different topologies as well. It's kind of cool to see, and I'll have to explain more about that in a moment. Um, but yes, nominally they do quote this as 75 watts by two, 140 watts by two, and a thousand watts by one. Um, if you go down to two ohms, um, the 75 watt channels don't permit a two ohm load, um, but the other channels do. So you could go as far as 75 watts by two, 250 watts by two and a thousand watts by one at two ohms but really you know this is uh this amplifier ain't here to fuck spiders this is a serious amp you know being able to do 75 by two and 140 by two as well as a thousand watts by one um yeah serious bit of hardware it's not a small amplifier it's not designed to be small it's designed to be good um you know i, I love small equipment I love small equipment, and these days the trade-off you get with small equipment um, is smaller than ever. But guess what? This amp's big. This big amp's big, it's powerful, it makes no apologies for its capabilities or its size, and there's something pretty cool about that too, especially when you have a no-holds-barred build like what I'm doing. So let's check this out. Whoa. Okay, so we've got the amplifier. I've also got a number of accessories. I'm gonna have to get that box out of the way, otherwise. I'm never going to fit it all. Um, I'll come back to these in a sec. Let's unbox this amp. Wow, look at this thing. Man, that's got some heft to it. That's got some gravity, as uh, a certain YouTuber would quote. It's got some gravity to it. And look, it's a beautiful understated design, a lot like uh, a lot of Audison's Vogue Jade gear really nice and understated and classy but this is all solid solid die cast alloy um really hefty it's amazing so on the top there's not a whole lot to see normally um you've actually got a few indicators down here you've got your gain controls um quite why they're not under the cover i'm not sure not really important i suppose um, and then you've got these nice cap head screws um, with some tinted acrylic covers with controls underneath them and connections under this end. I'll take them off at some stage, but they've got a protective film on there and that's gonna stay on until the amplifiers are in and working. I've always loved the curved profile here, especially since it steps to a flat profile as well. It's kind of interesting. And I love these cap head screws along the side, these chromed cap heads, really cool. It just gives it a really industrial uh, but refined look. And the underside here, a little bit of ventilation and uh, information about the amplifier itself. There's also actually a little bit of ventilation in the top, if you can see there. Room for air to escape. Presumably it comes through the bottom vents and then out through these vents up near the top. So that's kind of cool. Okay, then we've got some connections. It is a five channel amplifier, which actually means it's got six inputs in three pairs. Um, you can actually do a few different things with this, which has always baffled me a little bit, but that's all okay. Um, so you've got A, B, and C channels, and um, A are your two lowest power channels, if you like. Um, B are your other stereo channels. C are the subwoofer channels on the input. And um, you can actually do uh, different things with these. So you can uh, A inputs, are always going to be um, your, your A inputs. So they're always gonna serve that purpose. 
the B inputs you can actually switch so that the B channels use the A channel inputs, in which case this is actually a pre-out, so that can go on to another amplifier. Similarly, on the C channels, you can, you can use C channels as A plus B, so it sums them, or you can have the separate C input channels. So what that means is you can actually run all five channels of output on this amplifier from one pair of inputs, um, or you can run uh, this amplifier from two sets of inputs if you don't have a, sub, a pair of sub-channels. So I guess that's reasonably flexible and it's something that's often missing on, on four-channel amplifiers and five-channel amplifiers is to be able to select how many sets of channels you actually want to drive it from. You've also got ART, which is a signal sensing turn-on that you can use. And over here, we've got speaker level inputs. This is where things get a little bit interesting to me. This is uh, arguably a pretty high quality amplifier. Uh, it's a pretty top end amplifier really. And look, it's beautiful that they've got these inputs and I'm sure that they are high quality, high level inputs and the automatic turn on is a great idea if you've got a factory head unit and you wanna connect it directly to this amplifier. But it begs the question why you'd actually wanna do that if you're buying an amplifier at this level um, and you're using arguably, presumably, you'd be using quite a good speaker system, why don't you get a DSP as well? Um, that would be my question. I realise DSPs cost money, but so do amplifiers that are this good. Um, to me, I don't see a massive need for high-level inputs. Um, and to an extent, even these, these channel controls are mainly to do with these um, high level inputs. If you're running a DSP, you've got more than enough channels to uh, run these as well. So, you know, I, look, it's, it's great that they've included them. I'm not uh, putting them down for it, but at the same time, I question their relevance on a high end amplifier. Let's get these covers off and have a little bit more of a look at the connections. And what I can do is show you what comes in this pack at the same time. All right, so. We have a quick start guide for the Voce series amplifiers. It shows you how to plug plugs into plugs. Um, and it actually gives you a fairly useful power supply cable um, diagram to help you choose what size speaker cable and power cable you want to use on it. So that's pretty cool. You've just got to interpret the many shades of red some connections you can use for the 5.1K specifically, which is kind of cool. And uh, then it also shows that you can fit AD link um, digital control modules to it as well. Um, I can do that. Um, I'm not specifically for this setup and I'm gonna talk you through that later. You've also got, uh, th and this is actually pretty cool, you've got test tracks on a disc, as well as the owner's manuals on a CD that comes with the amplifier. That's pretty cool. So you've got a sine wave sweep, a white noise track, 10 minutes, 15 minutes respectively. You've got 10 minutes of pink noise, and then you've got sine wave sweep. So 50 hertz, uh, so sorry, a fixed sine wave at 50 hertz and a sine wave at one kilohertz, both at zero dB reference level. Um, so that's actually quite thoughtful to include with an amplifier. That's really nice of them. Good on them. You've got a warranty booklet, as you always do. And then you've got mounting screws and a replacement fuse. So this is a nice gold-plated 100 amp MIDI fuse. You may call that a different type of fuse. I don't care. I call it a MIDI fuse. There's a number of different classifications for it. And what I'm not doing right now is trying to extricate the... Oh, there we go. trying to get out the Allen key to undo these things. Screws are good as well. Um, actually kind of relevant. Um, when you've got deep mounting holes and specific sizes for screws, it's really nice to have the uh, proper mounting screws for them. All right, so let's pull this cover off and have a look. And again, I do quite like that these connections are covered up, although it makes me wonder why they couldn't cover up the gain controls as well. I mean, I know why, there's not enough room for that, but um, it would have been nice if they've designed it such that they could. Some nice countersunk uh, socket screws, which is very nice. 
and this panel. So like I say, that's a tinted panel. You can actually see through it. And it's got some protective film that I'm going to leave on for the time being, like I said. And you've got your crossover options here. Let's check them out. All right, so we have four indicated lights here. Um, top left is on, and that's obviously a power LED. Apparently that turns on green. I've got a thermal LED, and um, that actually works in a few different steps. It says it's pretty advanced. If the amplifier's um, operating temperature goes above 60 degrees Celsius, it's gonna blink slowly, and it reduces the amplifier's output by 2 dB. So obviously that's a little bit of effort to keep the thing playing, but derate it so that it doesn't uh, cack itself. Um, if it gets above 70 degrees, it will, it's degrees Celsius, all right. Uh, it'll reduce the output by 3 dB and it f flashes quickly. And then it turns on, if it turns on completely, it means the amplifier is trying to operate above 80 degrees Celsius and uh, that'll shut off until the amplifier cools down to 75 degrees. So pretty good thermal management. It's gonna, it means that, that this thing's gonna manage itself rather than just turning off completely um, at higher temperatures. You've got an overload LED and that's essentially a low impedance um, LED. That, that will uh, cut the output of the amplifier if there's a speaker which goes below half an ohm impedance. So uh, a smart overload protection there and then um, a speaker LED, which actually means uh, that that's a protection um, against short circuit to ground. So these two perform two different overload uh, or low impedance situations, one um, for impedance, low impedance on the speaker wires and another one for short circuit to the chassis of the car. And in both cases that cuts the output of the amplifier and uh, shows the appropriate LED and they're fixed by turning the amplifier off and back on again. So a fairly smart management system on this, which is pretty cool. Then on here, you've got controls for these channels and you can see that they've set up the topology of these filters um, so that you can manage a three-way setup with tweeters, mid-bass and subwoofer. So channel A has got selectable high or full range, um, high pass or full range switch here. And then you've got 50 to 500 Hertz um, with a um, multiplier here of by one or by 10. So you can high pass these um, from 50 Hertz to 500 Hertz or 500 Hertz to 5,000 Hertz. So that works well, whether you're crossing a mid range or a tweeter on channels A. Channels B, you can choose as a high pass, band pass or full range, which is pretty cool. This doesn't have the multiplier switch, um, but again, if you're using it uh, for a mid range or a mid bass, not as relevant. So high pass, you can choose uh, between 50 Hertz and one kilohertz. You can run, run quite a wide range of drivers from that at that point, uh, as well as being able to match up the low pass um, on channel B to the high pass on channel A between 250 and five kilohertz. So if you're running mid bass and a tweeter, that's gonna work really well for you. Finally, you've got the low pass on channel C, which you can allegedly run as full range or as a low pass filter um, between 50 hertz and 150 hertz. So it doesn't quite mat match up with the uh, high pass filter on here, um, but that makes perfect sense for most subwoofer setups anyway. So that's pretty cool. Now, here's the thing with Audison's Voce AV 5.1K amplifier. It's really quite a cool amp. And part of the reason is because of its design. Um, as you've seen me quote, it's 75 watts by two, uh, along with 140 watts by two and 600 watts by one. And that's because of the topology of the amplifier. Um, and it makes it amazing for driving two-way uh, and at fully active setups. It's because the 75 watt pair of channels is actually class A biased, which is one of the highest quality amplification topologies you can get. Uh, class A is incredibly pure. It's very, very inefficient, but incredibly pure. I would argue that that's not pure class A at 75 watts. That's incredibly demanding on an electrical system but it's at least class A biased so that it's running in class A for uh, low power outputs and switches to class AB for higher power outputs. When you're running a tweeter or a mid-range, that's really not a problem. 75 watts is a huge amount of power for treble or, or mid-range. So um, you're gonna be running in class A a lot of the time. That's amazing. 
your 140 watt at four ohm stereo channels are class a b a better balance of quality and efficiency but in an amplifier like this it's it's a very good class a b output stage then for the subwoofer amplifier you've got class d which is a really good a uh, good way of managing high power output and high efficiency to give us the power rating we do. To get all of that in one amplifier is amazing. It's a really cool piece of technology. I know it's not the first amplifier or the only amplifier to do it, um, but it's something we don't see as much of these days with a lot of full range class D around the place. Full range class D is fine and they've got so much better at it. It's, it's the majority of the amplifiers that we fit, but if you want a better amplifier, not just a really small efficient one, this is the way to go. What an amazing setup. All right, the last thing to check out on this is the other end. All right, we've got our power terminals here. Um, obviously, battery on the left, ground in the middle, cap on the right. Cap is for a power capacitor. If you believe in those sort of things, that connects there. I can only assume that that's connected in parallel with the battery input so that you've just got the lowest resistance connection for a capacitor and your power supply. Um, to your amplifier, you don't have to connect the capacitor elsewhere. These are two gauge capable terminals, um, so you can put a fairly large wire in there. I have no idea who still makes two gauge wire. Um, normally it's zero or four, but you can fit two gauge in there. And these these um, cable terminals, so the, the grub screw terminals for the speakers are quite oversized as well. They'll all take eight gauge any day of the week, which is pretty cool. Um, and you've just got to pay a little bit of attention to what you're connecting to. Um, so you've got your A channels on the inside here, left and right, positive on the top, negative on the bottom. So a little bit different lead lengths. You know, if you want to keep it really neat, you really ought to trim your wires down a little bit. And then you've got B left here and right over here. So again, you've got to have your wits about you. And then your C channel for your sub, because that's a mono, you've got a single output over here. Um, and like I said before, you've got subwoofer volume control and uh, remote input and output uh, up there. And that's a removable connector. So that's something that can be connected in advance and then plugged in later on. And like I say, you can daisy chain that remote signal. So this AV 5.1K, amazing amplifier. Just, just such a beautiful piece of electronic engineering uh, and, and a beautiful piece of understated but heavily engineered design. And I cannot wait to get something as powerful as this in the car, especially since I've got two of them. Wow, that's gonna be something else.